This week's podcast is sponsored by the Bowers & Wilkins 600 Series 3. The eighth generation of one of Hi-Fi's most acclaimed ranges features some of the most comprehensive upgrades the 600 Series has ever received. The Bowers & Wilkins 600 Series 3 is designed for every music lover. It's the attainable way to experience the joys of true sound at home. Discover more at BowersWilkins.com. Hello and welcome to the Performance Podcast for Monday the 23rd of October. It's October, it's grim up north, it's rather uh, cold at the moment. As you say, it's been wet and windy and now uh, it's now cold, so that explains the wear. Good evening, thank you very much for joining us. If you're joining us live uh, on YouTube, uh, great to see you there. Um, get your questions in, the chat window is open. If you're listening to us a little bit later in the week or month, uh, then hello to you as well. And if you have any questions, um, then you guys can get them in through the podcast forum. We'll give you all the details a little bit later on. Uh, first of all, I need to say good evening to the guys joining us tonight. Uh, all of them are regulars. But Ian Colin, Martin Jew, Julian Scott and Ed Silly. Good evening, guys. Hello, sir. Good evening. Hiya. And on the chat, good evening to Nigel Henry. Just seen Nigel pop up. And as Peter Fletcher as well. Good evening to you uh, on the live chat. Like I say, live chat's open. Uh, get your questions in tonight. Uh, questions on the subjects that, that we're talking about. So tonight I am reviewing. I'm not reviewing because the review's up on the site. Go read the, the review. I put my heart and soul into that. Um, but we'll, we're going to be discussing the Sony Bravia A95L. It's the most anticipated TV of the year. Uh, QD OLED, second gen. Um, this one has all the bells and whistles. The Samsung was good earlier in the year. Um, obviously, Sony introduced Dolby Vision into the mix, uh, as well as a few other bits and pieces. So we'll be covering uh, that a little bit later on. Martin's going to be looking at the Yamaha True X Dolby Atmos surround sound system. Interesting system, that. So we're going to get into that in a little bit of detail later on. Ed's obviously doing the local, uh, the, the local, the usual hi-fi stuff. Local, local hi-fi, Ed? What's local to you? It's local hi-fi for local people, Phil. You know that. <laughs> a tragic reflection on, on clientele. <laughs> Uh, so Ed's going to be uh, looking at some uh, hi-fi news and product. And of course, we've got a usual roundup of TV and home cinema and a couple of uh, discussion points tonight. Streaming. What's the best settings for streaming and how do you make sure that you are actually getting the best out of your streaming device and your display? Jules is going to tell us all about that. Uh, Jules sets these things up uh, on a professional basis for um, lots of clients. So he'll be telling us all about that. Yeah, a little bit later on. So that's all for a little bit later. Like I say, chat window's open. Um, competitions. We've got lots to get through here. And uh, Martin volunteered earlier on. So um, over to you, Martin. Okie dokie. Excuse me. I'll look at my other monitor here. Um, Ooh, firstly, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, current competitions. Um, the chance to win a pair of Bowers and Wilkins 607 S3 stand mount speakers and a con- Oh. All right. Um, am I on to disc competitions? Okay. Open to all forum all AV forum mem- forums members. I should get the name of our uh, website correct. Uh, the Broken Wood <laughs> Mysteries S9 on DVD ends at 11.59 p.m. Monday, 30th of October. Horror films Scream and Scream Again and The Dead Mother, both on limited edition Blu-ray from Radiance Films, both close 11.59 p.m. Tuesday, the 31st of October. Inside Man on Blu-ray, not Spike Lee's 2006 Denzel Washington crime drama, but a Stephen Moffat penned series starring David Tennant and Stanley Tucci. That closes at 11.59 p.m. on Thursday, the 9th of November. And finally, Surreal Estate, season one on Blu-ray, paranormal specialist clear haunted houses of their spectral occupants prior to sale that closes at 11 59 p.m on saturday the 11th of november and exclusive offers for patrons include cutthroat island on steelbook on 4k ultra hd closes 11 59 p.m tuesday the 24th of october cry the beloved country on blu-ray closes 11 59 p.m on sunday the 5th of november Jean-Pierre Jeunet's debut Delicatessen on 4K Blu-ray closes 11.59pm Sunday the 12th of November. 
and Transformers Rise of the Beasts on 4K mm -hmm. Blu-ray. Uh, Justice League X RWBY Superheroes and Huntsman Part 2, a DC animated adventure on Blu-ray. We've got Warner Brothers Studio Collection box set on 4K Blu-ray, a 30 film collection featuring Warner Brothers classics in 4K for the very first time, such as The Exorcist, Enter the Dragon, and Rebel Without a Cause. Mortal Kombat Legends, Cage Match, also on Blu-ray. So head over to abforums.com, competitions, sorry, slash competitions to enter. All competitions are open to eligible AB Forums members or patrons resident in the UK. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Martin. Ed, would you like to do the previous hardware competition winners? I can do, so long as my uh, running order actually restarts. No, look at this. Mr. Dot Black 79 won the aforementioned pair of Bowers and Wilkins 607 S3 speakers, which is why you can't enter the competition to win them, because they've been won. Yeah, Congratulations we'll to you, sir. We'll have lots with the producer of the Ryan. Yeah, the well, you know, unacceptable. Um, and Grey Counselor won a complete monitor audio and Rocktown hi-fi system worth £2,468 from AV.com, and that's really very good indeed. Um, yeah. Do you want me to do new supporters whilst I'm here? You can indeed. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, Titch77 bought us a coffee, so thank you for that. And we have uh, new patrons, Swiss Phony. Good, good name. I like that. TJ Slideman and Mark James. So thank you very much to all of you. Um, as Phil says, uh, we actually, before we went on, on air, we were discussing new bold plans for the podcast in, in 2024. Um, whether that will actually result in, in something perfect is, is unclear. But that's what we're shooting for. That's what we're going to try. Um, so uh, thank you for your ongoing support and uh, watch this space. Yep, thank you very much for your support, guys. And also thank you to uh, Peter Tyson and AV.com for those mm. uh, competition prizes. Excellent prizes there. Well done to the winners. Um, right, let's get on with the show next. Right, so um, TV time. We're going to talk about uh, the Sony in a little while. Uh, first of all, got a little bit of news. It's not a little bit of news, Ian. It's a big bit of news. Tell us yeah, all about it. It's a 100-inch piece of news from uh, Hisense, who have uh, announced uh, the yeah, new 100-inch U7K model coming to the UK. Uh, as some people will be aware, they've already announced the, the 55, or they've already released the 55, 65, and 75-inch version with a review of the 65-inch model on a website not too far away from here. Um, but yeah, they're adding a 100-inch model to that lineup, which will set you back a mere £4,999. Uh, and they're also adding an 85-inch version to the mix they'd announced previously but hadn't yet released. Uh, and that's coming along priced at £2,999. So what, 100 inches for under for five, five grand? grand. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing value. And I mean, do you remember when Panasonic TV. did that 102-inch yeah. plasma and yes. we all... Um, Polluted yeah. our well, it, it underpants wasn't that, and exactly. the, uh, they did a hundred and fifty inch, and uh, the guys that could afford that um, were probably guys that Jules has been out calibrating no. for this. Not see one of those, but um, um, yeah, yeah, like uh, one hundred and fifty grand. A, a they pot. were, uh, as, you know, it was yeah. it was you know serious serious. Yeah, yeah. I think it was like grand. seventy or eighty grand that Panasonic. Yeah, one hundred and three. Yeah, one hundred and fifty was yeah. it? How'd you get it through the door? Uh, it just fit. The 150, you you just fit. the 150, I think you had to take the windows out um, <laughs> to get them in. The, there was an article, John Archer did an article, oh, we're going back 12 years ago, um, in Home Cinema Choice, and they actually had the photographs of the crane because um, it had to go over the top of the house and then in through the back windows. Um, unbelievable. Unbelievable the lengths they went to get. So, yes, 100-inch TV. The U7Ks are fairly decent TV as well. And if you ask my opinion, would you get a laser shot through, ultra shot through projector with a light ambient light rejection screen or a 100 inch TV? I think I would side with the TV if it was HDR that you're after and you wanted uh. um, good contrast and, and all the rest of it. Um, uh. Yeah, I'd probably go that way. I'd probably lean that way. Um, and and unless I'd, I've seen cyber sides, I probably would go that way. Yeah, uh, but yeah, that's great value, Ed. Under five grand. Yeah, I just, I, have to, I mean, you know, quite apart my understanding of these things on a technical level is limited, as you know. It's just, I'm just thinking back to the the first time I remember someone talking about a three figure size flat yeah. screen and the price tags associated with that. And I mean, it, it just, it just, it, it emphasizes 
quite how extraordinarily the value the cost of these things has come down, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I, I did yeah. want to clarify. I meant ultra shot through a projector, not a projection system, because projection systems, as Martin knows, they have their own look, and people like a reflective image and a filmic. Uh-huh. Image. I'm on about these projectors that are sold as a TV replacement. Um, uh-huh. You know, shot through ultra shot through up against the wall and so on. Um, I think I would rather have. 100 inch tv if it was me just for a quality yeah. point of view but yeah it's interesting to see high sense doing that i've also just had an invite from tcl I, i'm not sure if i i'm going to be able to make it along to the event but they are launching and putting up their very large screen tvs um for reviewers to go and have a look at because they won't send these things out they're so large so <laughs> i am hoping to to make it along to that before the end of the year um we'll we'll see if that if that does uh come out but yeah, um, when you're talking about 98 inch, 100 inch, uh, and larger screens, um, getting them in for reviews, it, it it's not possible. So I think what we'll do going forward um, is look at the smaller screen sizes, the 65 inch, um, and then have to go off site um, to review the bigger, larger screens because we'll only get like a day to spend with them. But if we can have the smaller screen sizes to look at over a, a set period of time, it should um, give us a good idea of how those TVs will, will, will perform and then look at the larger screen size just to compare notes and see if you're getting the same value. So, yeah, great news there from Hisense. Uh, right, let's move on to TV review. The review is live. It's on the site now. It's a Sony A95L 4K QD OLED TV, available in three screen sizes, uh, 55, 65, and 77 inches. Um, I'll get you a price in, in a moment uh, because the, uh, these are expensive. Um, it's it's one of the major cons. Uh, they've come to market later in the year. Everybody's now um, in that cycle where we're getting close to Black Friday coming up. So the likes of LG were first to market this year with their OLED panels, followed by Samsung, and everybody else is kind of full of suit. So Sony are, unfortunately, last uh, to the party, which means that they do look expensive compared to the competition and um, they are expensive compared to the competition the 55 inch that uh, comes in at three grand or just a quid under three grand uh, 65 inch comes in at 3699 and the 77 inch is a quid under six grand um so that's a lot of money um for these tvs and in the past they may have gotten away with it with with uh you know their uh own display technology and all the rest of it. But at the end of the day, they're using a Samsung display panel with their processing on top of that. Um, they are introducing Dolby Vision, which Samsung won't do. Samsung, sort yourselves out. You're losing sales. You know, I don't, really don't, you, you know, you bit the bullet with OLED, bite the bullet with, with Dolby Vision um, and, you know, give have, people have, what they want at the end of the day. The bullet with LG OLEDs as well. Yeah, LG OLEDs yeah. as well. So yeah, yeah, go on, let's have some Dolby Vision on your sets next year. But yeah, um, the A95L, it brings Dolby Vision to the mix. Um, obviously, Sony have a huge background in professional displays. Um, as Jules will testify, I bet uh-huh. the vast majority of the screens that he calibrates in professional surroundings are Sony's. A lot of them, not all. Yeah. Not all. Other, other companies right. like FSI and you know, yeah. Finder Scientific and ASO and sort of, yeah, a yeah. lot of Sony's. Yeah, there are a lot of Sony's used in professional environments. And of course, um, the Master Series TVs are supposed to uh, look very similar um, in certain picture modes. So it used to be custom mode on the Sony. They've now changed that to professional mode. Um, It probably gives a a better understanding of what that mode is. They won't do filmmaker mode. And Sony are a company that do their own thing. And I think we'll just leave it at that. They, they, They like to think that that they know best when it comes to their products, um, which is a shame because everybody else in the industry has gotten behind the the uh, uh-huh. UHDA, um, you know, push for filmmaker mode. Uh, Sony haven't; they're only only major brand that hasn't done that. So that is a shame because uh, professional mode is not accurate. Um, it's it's getting there. It's not a million miles away, but again, I'd like to see a little bit of uh, better. Might have been sick a little bit then. <laughs> <laughs> Swallow it, Ian. <laughs> Where's oh. the remote? <laughs> right, I think we're back. Are we back, people? Are we back? Right, so it looks like we're back. Um, sorry about that. If you're watching us live um, at the moment, um, I've just seen us all pop back on screen there. So 
Uh, yeah, um, unfortunately, the software decided it was going to crash at that point. So I don't know how far uh, we got with that in terms of um, my review, but I'll, I'm going to pick it up at some point and we'll, hopefully it will make sense. So we were just talking about calibration modes uh -huh. in there and um, not very accurate out of the box or not as accurate as I like it to be out of the box. Uh -huh. It wasn't a million miles away, but but very close. Um, a couple of other interesting things that I want to touch on. You can go and read the review. The review is 5,000 words. Um, there's plenty in there. I cover it in quite some depth. I mean, it is one of the big TVs of the year, so I made sure um, that we covered uh, as much as possible. One of the things is motion flow has changed this year, so you can now separate out 24 frames per second and 1560. Um, so it's not a universal control now, Jules. Oh, so interesting. If you have low frame rate, so 24 frames per second, oh. um, and you see judder because of the near instantaneous response time of OLED, and some people do do pick up on that. Um, you know, we don't all see motion the same. Um, some people do pick up on that, and uh, you can set this control to plus one. And what it does is it, it basically adds a tiny amount of um, oh. interpolation. Uh -huh. but not enough that you would identify Notice. it as soap opera effect. So oh. it, it smooths it, but not to the degree where it smooths it, if that makes sense. It oh. gets rid of the, the stutter juddle that some people, and not Most, everybody, but some yeah. people do see. Reminds me of the sixth sense, I see dead people. Yeah. But it's, you know, for motion, for some people, oh. it, and, and again, you know, different display technologies. I used to see it with plasma. You know, I used to see rainbow. Um, um, effects with plasma displays running at 50 hertz. It was just the way that m my eye picked up on it, whereas other people didn't see it. So some people see flicker. Um, my uh, Canadian cousin, when she comes over to this country, cannot stand our TV uh, because she's so used to their broadcast system and her right. eye picks up on it straight away. So, so yeah, how people see things differently in terms of motion. Sony have, have given us two controls. So you've got film where you can add a little bit of smoothness, smoothness in, get rid of that judder with 24 frames per second. Uh, but you also separate out, and they've called it camera, smoothness camera um, setting, but it handles 50 and 60 hertz. So if you want to watch sports and you want a bit of smoothing added in, a little bit of swoop up effect, you could set it for 50, 60 hertz signals that there is, a little bit of interpolation added because it is video-based content that you're watching anyway. Uh -huh. um, and then with film-based content, obviously stuff that flags is 24 frames per second. Um, it'll uh, revert back to 5.5 pull down, but it'll add this little bit of smoothness in, um, which works really well. I mean, I could see it was because I knew what to look for, but I think for most people, I think it's a nice way of doing things within motion flow. So uh, kudos to Sony. Um, huh. for doing that it is a, a nice system and uh, the other thing is audio wise they're still using acoustic uh, surface audio plus i think it's a great system and um, nobody else has done it um lg have shown it uh well not lg electronics but lg display have shown it in closed door demos at ces for the last five years now where they have uh, sound all over the over the screen using the same type of idea but never brought it to market through lg electronics up to now um so sony are doing this so basically just to quickly explain what that is if you don't know it's two actuators um on the back of the screen which do the mid to high frequency range by basically vibrating the screen uh, the panel to create the sound and then there's two uh, subwoofers um also on the back of the TV, and they fill in the frequency response from mid and, and to the low end. Um, when you say subwoofers, don't expect heavy, boomy bass. That's not what they do. They basically fill in the, the lower frequencies. Um, but it's a, a really effective uh, sound system for those who want to just have the TV in the room and use the speakers built into the TV. The other thing is, um, and it's one of the things from cinema that we all love, and I know a lot of the custom jobs that Jules does, where um, you deliberately put the speakers behind a projection screen, use uh -huh. a acoustically transparent screen, is because it, it adds a little bit of realism. You know, the voice is coming from the actor's mouth, not from a point below or a point uh -huh. above the screen. It's actually, yeah. you know, coming from the mouth. And the Sony TVs, the, the way that they generate sound, it does come uh, from the actor's mouth, which adds that really nice bit of realism to, to what you're watching. You push it too hard, it does get brittle. It does start to distort. At normal living room levels, um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's very very good. I, I do like that system. Um, some other things to note: um, the TV will do 4K 120 gaming with Dolby Vision, but it won't do it out of the box. And uh, so the sample I had 
And I need to say that the sample was provided. It's a retail uh, unit, so it's not from a manufacturer. Uh, Peter Tyson uh, sent the TV over. Um, they have been supplying us with TVs this year um, and uh, given them to us on a long-term loan basis so we can do these reviews and we can do the comparisons. They have absolutely no say in how I do my reviews. They basically send me the TV. And uh, on Wednesday, I'm actually driving back to Carlisle to drop a couple of TVs off. Um, they have no say in it, but they help us uh, in terms of getting the sets, being able to hold on to the sets so we can put them side by side and do comparisons. So thanks to Peter Tyson for that. And if you uh, feel like supporting them, then uh, please do, because uh, they've certainly supported us putting our reviews together. Um, so yeah, I, out of the box, it won't do 4K 120 gaming. It will do it via firmware update. The other thing it won't do, if you watched my report from the Sony launch event back in January or February, um, there is a, a games option where you can make the screen smaller. It will do that, but only when it gets this firmware update because it's uh, something to do with the new Pentonic uh, chipset that's in here. Um, other things that I need to know, uh, two HDMI 2.1, 48 gigabit per second uh, inputs. One of them is EARC, so if you use a soundbar and you're using EARC, uh, you can kiss one of your 2.1 inputs goodbye, um, which is a shame. I'd like to see more manufacturers doing what TCL does and move uh, that e, e arc over onto an HDMI 2.0 port so you're not losing one of your 2.1 ports. It's not that important at the minute because you only have the two consoles, and if you're into gaming in a big way on PC then and you're 2.1 compliant, then, then great. But um, I still think two is probably just about enough for, for the vast majority of people. Um, in terms of uh, input lag and so on, 16.3 uh, milliseconds is 60, 4K 60, and 7.9 milliseconds at 120. Um, I can only test at 1080, 120. It's a limitation of the Leo Bodner um, tester, but that will be the same for 4K. Um, it doesn't change that much. And the smart system is Google. Uh, Google's very good. There is an issue with Google at the minute. I'm not 100% sure what the politics are, and I'm not going to guess, and I'm not going to jump into anything that might get us into trouble, but um, there is no uh, Freeview Play. There is no catch-up services. There's no BBC iPlayer or uh, Channel 4 or wow. ITV or anything at the moment. Um, but that's not just for Sony. That's uh, The Philips is the same. I've got the Philips 908 sitting to the side here. Uh, they're brand-new flagship with MLA panel. And again, it's Google TV and it doesn't have any of that stuff on board at the minute. Um, we expect it to turn up. Um, but yeah, it's just one of these things that, that's not there at the moment. Um, however, it's something we're going to come on to in a little bit and talk with Jules. Um, if you want stuff at the at correct frame rates and um, and so on, sometimes it's better to use an external uh, streaming device rather than um, some of these streaming uh, applications that are built into TVs because they are restricted to 60 hertz, um, a lot of them. So um, sometimes you are better uh, using a standalone device like the, the Apple TV. Uh, so just wrapping up on this, like I say, the, the reviews up there, it's, um, it's a 10 out of 10, but there's no such thing as a perfect TV. So, you know, the caveat is there's no such thing as perfection because the LG also got 10 out of 10. Both of those TVs are... It's very, very difficult to separate them out. You're separating them out on other attributes other than picture quality. Um, both of them are absolutely outstanding. They're both uh -huh. at the top of their game. This Sony is a, an outstanding TV, but at £3,700 for a 65-inch, I ain't buying one until the price comes down a bit because the LG is 1200 quid cheaper. Yeah, it's um, a lot of money. That's a huge amount of money because the is. performance... As much as I like the Sony, the performance difference is not twelve hundred quid in anybody's yeah. book. So yeah. you could buy uh, a second second LG OLED for that spare you could, change, couldn't you? You could, yeah, yeah. A it's, lower it's, lower spec one, but yes, you could have a second TV. Yeah. So now's probably not the time to buy. Um, is what I'd say. I would buy one if the price was more reasonable and more in line with the peers. Um, so I don't know, maybe Sony will look at that uh, a little bit further along the line. Uh, but it, it's a cracking TV. Picture quality, I cannot fault the picture quality. The other thing is picture processing, upscaling, motion, all that kind of thing. Sony do it better than everybody else. Everybody else is starting to catch up now. Um, LG is very, very close. Um, sometimes you can't tell the difference between the, the you know, it's so close. And when you have, and this is a big thing that people need to be aware of, what we're talking about here in terms of differences are minute differences that I see when I have the two screens side by side. Uh -huh. um, 
the vast majority of the time, you're not going to see the things that I see here. Um, just one final thing to end on. I don't know if you've had any um, experience yet, Jules, with the second gen uh, QD OLED panels, whether professionally or, or not. But last year, yeah. last year the A95K and the uh, and the Samsung S95B were incredibly clean uh -huh. when it came to uniformity, especially low uniformity five percent brightness um uh -huh. there was nothing there that's not the case this year so this is two qd oled second gen sets that i've looked at um it's not bad it's not as bad as a wrgb um or some of them can look uh, but there is a little bit of vertical banding um at the very lowest levels uh which is it's interesting it's not important is what i'd say um interesting in terms of Last year, they were very, very clean. Obviously, the push and brightness now, um, this is a lot brighter than last year. I, I, it's, uh, uh -huh. I don't know my notes. Give me a sec. It and is. This, is, this is out of the box, isn't it, Phil, though, isn't it? Because um, you put a few hours on these these units as well, but over a period of time, uniformity does tend to improve. It, it will improve. And again, um, you know, if you are having trouble with uniformity, force a compensation cycle. Uh -huh. Um, it's easy to do, go into the menus and just force it to do a, a cleanup. Um, I have had an issue with this Philips that came in for review. That solved the vast majority of the issue that I had with the set, um, just doing a, a compensation cycle. Um, oh. So, yeah, go into the menus and do that. So out of the box, um, there is a little bit um, of vertical banding. Um, I had the Samsung for, I want to say, six months now. Um it's still there, but you only see it in a pitch black room really looking for it. Um, you can't see it with content. You can't see it when playing uh, dark content in a dark room. It ain't there. Um, it's only seen with slides and test patterns, so don't worry about it. Um, yeah, so uh, A95L measured in at 1,348 nits on a 10% uh, industry standard window, which is in the most accurate uh, professional mode. Um, 255 nits on 100% full screen. So that's bang in line with the Samsung S95C and the uh -huh. LG G3. They're all uh -huh. there and thereabouts, those figures. So yeah, um, so difficult to to separate them out. And like I say, you get them side by side, it's you're coming down to really tiny little differences. So just bear that in mind when you're reading things, when you're watching yeah. you know, the 17th YouTube video on the same TV, yeah. um, that what you're talking about, are minute little differences between how a manufacturer does a thing compared to another manufacturer. Um, most notably, tone mapping is where you're going to see some differences. You know how, and Sony definitely do it different to everybody else. Doesn't mean they do it any better or any worse. They just do it a little bit differently. So anyway, the reviews up there. Go read it. Um, and it's nice to get a premium remote control, but then you pay three thousand seven hundred pounds for the TV. Um, but yeah, LG, take note. We don't want plastic rubbish with our you know, very expensive tv so um right i think that wraps up that review um and uh what have i got coming up for review okay so coming up i'm still working on the tcl c 745 it's currently being my living room workhorse at the moment um and it's holding up really well for for a budget tv it's a cracking little telly um it is mini it's not mini led it's a file set so fully full array local dimming. I'll get my words right tonight, get my teeth in. Um, but yeah, it's it's a cracking little TV, so review coming up for that soon. Like I alluded to, I also have the uh, the Philips OLED Plus 908. Uh, that is their flagship TV for this year, MLA, so micro lens array uh, with Meta. Um, it has the boosting technology in there. Uh, 1,600 nits is what I measured on the first time around. Um, obviously, I don't measure it just the once, do it a couple of times. Uh, while it's here for review. But yeah, that was quite impressive. Jules at 10%, um, 1,600 odd nits. That's... Yeah, very good. Very good, yeah. Um, so yeah, I expect the full review for that next uh -huh. week. I'm also working at the moment on the Panasonic MZ 1500, which will be a short form review, um, just because I've done the 2000 and the 980. It sits bang in the middle. Yeah, you kind of know what to expect. So it'll be a short form review for that. And I've also got their mini LED TV for the year, the MX. 950, and again, it's another cracking little TV. Um, been really impressed with it. Uh, it has that Panasonic look, which a lot of people in brighter rooms have, have you know, kind of lamented the passing of the, I think it was the 902 um, from a, a quite a number of years ago when, when they last did a, a proper LED LCD TV. So 
Uh, so yeah, um, we've got that review coming up as well. So that's everything for TV this week. Uh, but we've got some TV conversation coming in the home cinema section, which is coming next. If you'd like to support the AV Forums podcast on a regular basis, then why not become a patron? Head over to patreon.com forward slash AV Forums to sign up. You can send us a YouTube super chat or buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash AV Forums. All donations help us to improve the website and the podcasts. Thank you to all our supporters. Right, home cinema section. What are we talking about this week? Uh, first of all, news items. Uh, we've got some speakers, we've got a laser projector, and we've got Netflix yet again. So, Ian, take it away. What have we got news wise? Yeah, kicking off uh, with some new Wharfdale speakers. Um, could technically come under hi fi as well because following on from the uh, Aura speakers that were announced earlier in the month, uh, Wharfdale's announced a uh, similarly new and improved DX3 speaker package. They are available both as a stereo pair or as part of a wider 5.1 home cinema package. Uh, essentially, the new ingredients are the new bookshelf stereo speakers, which, as people might have guessed, build upon the DX2 predecessors, uh, basically using a lot of upgraded tech from the Wharfdale's Diamond 12 series. Uh, on their own as a pair, the stereo speakers are £149, but you can double them up uh, and add in a DX3 centre channel for the uh, satellite bundle, which is priced at £349. Or you can also add in a uh, powered 70 watt, 70 watt subwoofer for the full home cinema package, which will cost you £499, uh, which could be you know, quite a tidy little setup for the as an answer to that common question of you know, what's a good home cinema surround system for under £500. Good stuff. Uh, just Any roll on through it. That, Ed? I remember testing an older version of this donkey's years ago, and it was unreasonably good for the money. 2018. I, uh, yeah, something like that. I have it does sound I, no, mate. It doesn't sound as recent as that, to be fair. But they've been doing the Wharf does been doing these for donkey's years, and they are absurdly good at it. I have every confidence that this will be unreasonably good for for the asking price this time around as well. Good, and uh, I'm sure we'll uh, we'll get that one in for review, and I'm sure I'll, uh, Martin will volunteer for that. If not, one of the other guys will. Uh, right, move on. Laser projector. Yeah, uh, following on from the 100-inch Hisense TV we talked about earlier, uh, Hisense has also announced PX2 Pro laser cinema projector for equally big screen entertainment. Uh, it's an ultra short, uh, ultra short throw laser projector. Uh, as people would have guessed, it's a follow-up to the PX1 Pro from last year. Uh, it comes in a little more expensive at £2,499, uh, but with the extra money, you get an improved brightness. It's now up to 2,400 lumens, and it also switches to an Android TV operating system. Otherwise, it seems like a similar 4K UHD model to, to last year. It's capable of displaying images up to 130 inches from a, about the same distance as away as an old high school ruler. Uh, I mean, after the discussion earlier about the TV, it might not be considered a direct alternative to the 100-inch U7K, uh, but it could be a, a decent uh, and obviously slightly more affordable option. It's about half the price, isn't it, uh, Ian? Yeah, 2499 as opposed yeah, to the TV, so exactly which is 4999 So, yeah. yeah, saves a lot of money if you're... But as you mentioned earlier, it might not be the same quality, but half the price. Yeah. You know, but again... Um, it's also not there when you're not watching it, or rather it's rather less of it's there when you're not watching it, you, which is... Yeah. <clears throat> You need a screen with these. That's the thing. Mm, yeah. I, I don't know. It's it's less of a black. Re there are ways and means of dressing it so it's less of a gigantic black rectangle. Um, I would say. I, I would say with the the laser projectors, the shot through, you need a screen. Um, I've done it on the wall with them, mm. and uh, you lose a lot of performance. Yeah, because um, the contrast isn't great on these, no. um, and no. you're going to need some ALR screen in a living room oh. to help you with the black levels. Yeah. Um, so I know the PX1 that I had in, and I haven't gotten the review out in time because the PX2's come out in the meantime, um, but <laughs> did to say whether this comes with a screen or not, Ian, because the PX1 Pro didn't. It was That was the thing with it. It didn't come with a screen. No, no, I think that, yeah, like you say, as part of the, why the price still is, that there's no screen involved, as opposed yeah. to like the laser throw TVs that they do where they yeah. actually so, yeah. sell them with the screen. Yeah, so I had a look at the PX1 Pro. It's a really good little unit. But yeah, like I said, I have tried them on the wall. Um, I had the four movie in at the same time. Contrast yep. is pretty poor. You really need a screen of some type um, uh. to get the best out of these. Um, and that's what I would recommend to anybody that was seriously considering uh, an ultra shot through a projector. 
think about the screen um, and think about the screen surface that you're going to use with it. Um, otherwise, you're you're literally throwing money away because you're throwing picture away. Um, just just by the way these things work. Um, right. Anything else we need to talk about news wise, Ian? Uh, just quickly, uh, you mentioned Netflix earlier on. Uh, news is basically the Q3 reports came out. Uh, and as part of it, they announced their raising subscription fees in the UK, US and France, basically with immediate effect for new subscribers, presumably for the next month for existing users. Uh, the the basic with ads package stays the same uh, as does the standard package. Uh, what's increasing is the basic uh, plan, which is no longer available for new customers as it's being phased out in the likes of the UK and the US. But people that are already on that package will see their monthly fee rising by a pound to 7 99 uh, perhaps the bigger news for more people is that the premium package, which is the one that comes with all the 4K HDR and Dolby goodness, jumping up by £2 to £17.99. Uh, it is the first increase in the UK since March 2022, uh, but it does come at a time with Netflix also announcing increasing revenue up to $8.5 billion past quarter, mm. $8.5 billion, that is, uh, and also adding some 207 million new subscribers over those three months. So yeah. uh, whilst you could possibly understand their logic that it's been a while since they had a price increase and everybody else is up in their prices, it's still not exactly going to be a popular move for their customers. No, I don't think it will be popular. Um, but again, I think we, we then start going down a, a, a rabbit hole of uh, physical versus streaming and what's the quality on Netflix and all the rest of it. So I think we'll we'll cap that one for tonight before we, we go off on a tangent. But yes, I, I don't think that'll be very popular with a lot of people. But anyway, we'll stick to streaming services because more and more people are using them. The quality is definitely getting better. Um, it, it's coming on leaps and bounds. Uh, services like uh, Disney Plus um, have really... Uh, you know, changed the way that we think about streaming services in terms of what they give you in terms of Dolby Vision, Dolby Atmos, um, how the films are presented, the quality. Um, I've just reviewed a TV from Sony. They have their own Bravia Core uh, service on there where you get 80 megabits per second uh, touted as, as being the best streaming offer, but that's not a service that anybody can subscribe to. It comes with a TV. You get uh, 12 or 24 months access to it and then it closes off for you so it's a bit of a closed system that one but lots of these uh, services are around jewels um, yes. so for home cinema fans for home theater fans for people who love movies and want to get the best out of um, the latest netflix blockbuster in inverted comments um what are the best sense what are the best devices that they need to be using what are the things that they really should be thinking about well, if we start with the obvious one, with which you just mentioned, which is Netflix, um, the question about this is, are they doing anything different to anybody else? Is there some special source in Netflix content? And the answer is there isn't. I mean, I did a calibration yesterday on a couple of grading monitors uh, that we're going to be using on a Netflix production this week. And the calibration targets are exactly the same as everything else. You know, SDR, X709, D65, Gamma 2.4, et cetera, 100 nits on the grading monitor. There's no special source to these things. And the picture modes that you might find in your TV, like you know the Netflix uh, calibrated mode, are not doing anything different. Then they're, they're no different. Um, there's no special source in them, if you know what I mean. So I would just say, as we keep repeating every single week, nowadays, filmmaker mode, um, even with your streaming content, is the place to go to. There's there's nothing special about these these modes in the TV for streaming services. Yeah. Um, and you are at the mercy of the bit rates, aren't you? I mean, you mentioned the Sony Bravia Core, which obviously boasts up to 80 megs per second, uh, which is you know it's getting towards Blu-ray, isn't it? 100 megs megs. Um, but um and and generally speaking i'm you know i can watch a netflix movie or a, or a movie from uh, disney and uh, even on my projection screen which is quite large and i can more or less be you know content with that although i still prefer um you know physical media uh, or kaleidoscape um so um things are improving as you say but there's nothing special in those modes that we can't get already from filmmaker or in you know a, a, another yeah. mode Isn't it that's an important point to make because you, you get IMAX enhanced, you get uh -huh. you know Netflix calibrated, filmmaker mode, movie mode, cinema mode. It does confuse people. Yep. I've sat and made, and I still do it. I sit and measure these modes on the TVs, and they all measure the same because uh -huh. they're all targeting the same uh, yep. standards, and that's what we want. And people say, well, 
you know, and you're going to have TVs all looking the same if we, everybody uses filmmaker mode. Bingo. <laughs> That's the point. Yes. That is the point. Uh, you want to replicate um, the creator's intent. The creator creates inside an envelope. And as long as your TV can display that envelope, you see what's created. Uh -huh. So they yep. might push red, they might desaturate the color, they might do some tricks uh, in their grading suite with, I want it to look totally magenta or I want it to look green or whatever. Um, as long as your TV is able to show that envelope and they're still working within that envelope, they can do all that. They can desaturate, they can yep. oversaturate, they can do everything within these standards. And as long as your TV set to that, you still see what's supposed to be seen. The problems are when you get modes that that add too much color, add too much brightness. And the first thing people say to you when you show them Filmmaker and so on, tools, and you get all the time, maybe uh -huh. not in the professional clients, but you know, uh -huh. other clients will say, it's, it's, it's dim. Well, that's kind of the point. It's not supposed it to. It is you know, be um, blazingly bright and, and vivid and, and uh, all the rest of it. It's uh, supposed to, it's art at the end of the day. Um, that, that's, it's a certain way. that's absolutely right. We're preserving the art form. Um, and by having your display calibrated to those same references that the content was created, you are um, seeing as much as possible what the director intended, you know, um, the famous director's intent. There are some things we can do to adjust for environment. You know, if you're sitting miles away from your display, uh, for example, the 100 nits on the grading monitor is specified for a certain distance from the screen. So if you sit further away, of course, we can increase the uh, the peak output of the display to compensate. Um, so there, there are things that we can do to take environment into account uh, and, and continue to preserve the artistic intent. But, um, you know, that's, um, that is the objective uh, is to replicate that, that mastering mastered yeah, content. I think, I think the important thing here to clarify as well, Jules, is that when you're talking about hundred nits, um, uh -huh. on the read monitor, you're actually talking about SDR content, SDR. you're talking about yeah, broadcast yeah. TV. Yeah. Um, that kind of thing. We're not talking about HDR at this precise moment in time. We're just talking yeah, that's about right. normal. I would also programming. say that I, I prefer watching uh, just regular broadcast TV in the cinema mode as well. I mean, once uh -huh. you get into that, yeah. what people would clean. class as that duller, dimmer picture, it's actually the one that you can't live without in the end for all, all sources, exactly. I would say. Exactly. Yeah. And, and again, another misconception, but your sports broadcasts, your live sports yep. broadcasts, your... Uh, live events, your Strictly's, your all these big productions, all the cameras have to match, or yep. otherwise it looks diabolical. So yeah. they're all working within a standards envelope, uh, which is exactly the same standards envelope as the movie industry, as the indeed. games industry. They all work within, and as long as your yep. display is capable of doing that, you're seen as, as it is intended to be seen. Um, Everything on set has to match. Yeah, everything on set has to be matched and matched perceptually, also with different display technologies. So if you've got OLED on a, a you know a, a set, um, you might have LCD <laughs> as well, and we perceptually match all these displays to look like each other. But that used yeah. to be the problem with NTSC, wasn't it? Never twice the same color, yeah. Jules, yeah. where yeah. apparently all the monitors were all calibrated differently at the studios. So you could never yeah. be sure you were getting the right thing. Well well, thankfully now we uh, we're you know Miles we're able to that. we're able to nail these things. Um so yeah. There's no there's nothing again about sports, as you mentioned, Phil rightly. There's nothing I get asked, you know, what about sports modes? Well, there's nothing unique to to yeah. that, you know. Yeah. Of course, one of the things I hope that develops is increase, you know, higher frame rates for sports, um, so we can get you know smoother motion. But you know, when it comes to film, I'm a bit of a fuddy duddy and still want my 24 frames, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess the the, the question I always get asked, Jules, uh -huh. is is well, you know, you reviewers, you calibrators, you know, you know, you tell people to switch this mode off, that mode off, and put it into this mode. Why are manufacturers releasing? these TVs with these modes on if they're useless. Well, the, at the end of the day, if you're a manufacturer, you cover your ears at the minute. Um, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, they have to sell product uh -huh. and they have marketing departments and 2,000 is bigger than 1,000 uh -huh. and 3,000 is bigger than all of them. So what they want is they want big numbers. They want uh, things that they can throw at a market in and say, well, look at this, look at what it can do. And I like the guy a lot. I've got a lot of respect for him, but this is where people like Danny Tarkett Phillips come in because they want to take it beyond reference. And there is no beyond reference. No. It's reference and reference only. And, you know, you got to love the guy for it because, you know, 
he knows his customer at the end of the day. He knows that the vast majority of consumers are going to buy the brightest picture. And what he wants to give them is the best looking brightest picture. Uh-huh. So I totally get, and I totally understand where, where he's coming from and other manufacturers are coming from. But at the end of the day, that is the reason why you have, um, you know, super reality creation, sharpening, all these different modes that are on these TVs, marketing. Yeah, And the problem is if all the TVs were set up properly the way they should be set up so you can see the content as it was mm-hmm. supposed to be seen, you would go into a, a, a showroom and everything would look the same. Yeah, Sony would look the same as the Philips, would look the same as the Panasonic, and, and you don't sell anything like that. So yeah, when we're telling you to switch things off, it's because these things are damaging to the picture. If you want to see the picture as as it's supposed to be seen, if you want to see the matrix green and and you know and the real world is a slight blue, you know you have to have the TV set properly. Otherwise, you ain't going to see that. Um, so yeah, I think that's a very important point. Just to wrap up frame rates, Jules. Uh-huh. Uh, so I alluded to it a little bit earlier on. How do people? How can people check that the TV is doing motion correctly? Well, I mean, there are test sticks you could use, like Spears and Munsell. You can you can have a look, and you can you know if you want to invest in one of those, then it's not that expensive. You can put one of those in and see. Um, generally speaking, though, frame rate wise, again, if you put it into filmmaker mode, it will display it you know correctly, uh, unless there's some issues um, internally within the TV with its three two pull down and all the rest of it. So. Um, Rarely do I find a need to resort to the motion controls in any display. I mean, there've been some instances in the past where Samsung, Samsung, you know, needed that kind of thing, to, where it wasn't doing it correctly out the box yeah. in its best mode, the movie mode. Um, but very rarely do I feel any need to resort to using motion controls. But of course, when you said earlier, um, there may be some people who are sensitive to some some sort of twenty four frame panning jada. Um, obviously, yes, there are people who may need to do that. And interested to hear what Sony are doing in the A95L with that regard. Yeah. But, yeah. but, um, but it's interesting that, that some of these streamers out there, um, certainly some of the external streamers, will do um, frame rate conversion a lot better um, yeah. and actually display it properly than some of these built-in players, which are fixed to fifty or sixty um, and have to do three two. Um, you know, yes. Yeah. It swings around a bit, but if you can use yep. an external that, that lets yep. you or you can set it to do the correct frame rate conversion, then do that because uh-huh. that will get you the look as it's supposed to be rather than, um, you know, it, it having a little bit of judder in there and so on. So, yeah, I think we've covered just about everything. But if you've got any questions about streaming um, and getting the best picture quality, I, at the end of the day, you're down to bit rates a lot of the time. But exactly, um, yeah. if there are things that you want to know about in terms of how we should set up the TV, other um, any tips and tricks or so on, then get your questions in, put them into oh. uh, the thread underneath this podcast in the podcast forums at AV Forums. Mm-hmm. What are you going to say, Jules? I would just say, you know, with streaming content, obviously it can be low, very low bit rate and you can have artifacts as a result of that, yeah. especially near black. So there may be, I mean, generally speaking with a very good source, like a Blu-ray, something like you don't, I don't need anything like, you know, noise reduction, et cetera. But occasionally if it's a really crappy one, then you you know you might resort to some sort of MPEG noise reduction, all this kind of you know, and, and smoothing as well. So so um, the Sony kind of brought that in uh, first yeah. of all, didn't they? Um, as well for banding, so yeah. very occasionally, but only if it's a really bad source, and you can't really save crap, can it? You know, if it's gonna, you're limited to the quality of the incoming signal. Yes, absolutely. Um, I stopped testing SD channels a long time ago, but now and mm. again I do dip in just to see how the pro, you know today's processors are dealing with it. Mm-hmm. There, there's no medical workers out there. No. It, you put crap in, you get crap out. Basically. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But yes. Okay. So thanks for that, Jules. Like I say, if you've got okay. any questions, any follow up on this um, that you want us to look into or discuss. Uh, we haven't even touched on the audio side. That This was just the uh, video side of things. Um, then, yeah, leave your question in the podcast forum underneath this podcast, and we'll get back to it. Now we need to say goodbye to Jules at this point because he's off for football training. Um, Indeed. So, yeah. he scored a hat-trick the other week. Did you really? Oh, yeah, perfect hat-trick. Left foot, right foot header. Uh, so it's time to retire, I think, isn't it? If you say so. Why do you – Norwich need me, Ian. Norwich needs me. What, what it you depends. Doing, if Sam? you're doing too many headers, Jules, yeah, it is time to retire before, <laughs> you know, the, the, the more serious issues. It's all those old leather balls that they're doing me in. 
Mm. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Cheers, guys. Good evening, Jules. <laughs> we'll see you later. Good night. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Right. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Home Cinema Wise, we need to move across to Martin in a second. But first of all, there are some games and tech news to talk about, Ian, very quickly. So why don't we go through that? Yeah, it's mostly all gaming stuff. So I'll, I'll try to speed through it uh, relatively quickly. Um, starting off with a bit of PlayStation news. Uh, Sony has finally got around to confirming the new slimline PlayStation 5 designs that's been anticipated for quite some time and is likely to become the core models in the near future. Uh, so there's a new PS5 and PS5 Digital Edition, which are essentially the same console, but just thinner and lighter than the launch models. And they also come with more storage with an upgraded one terabyte SSD on board. Uh, the only downside, I was kind of hoping that they might come with a price drop as well. But when they launch in November, they'll still be at the same RRP as the original consoles were. So the PS5 will still cost you £479. Uh, the digital edition will cost you £389, although you can get the latter with an external Blu-ray uh, for an additional £99 as well, if you want to watch Blu-rays in the digital edition. A uh, quick side note to that, Sony also announced some new uh, in-zone buds wireless earphones for, for gamers. Uh, they're due to launch on the 31st of October, priced at £185, £180, sorry. Uh, and as of today in Europe, PlayStation Plus premium members will have access to cloud streaming for PS5 games. Uh, I think it starts with a fairly limited library to kick off, but obviously there's a lot of big names to come in uh, the months to come. So there could be some uh, really good streaming options for PS5 owners. Um, moving quickly across to some Microsoft news, which might have been hard to miss for some people. Uh, it's been one of the longest will they won't they dramas of recent years, but Microsoft has finally claimed victory in its bid to buy out Activision Blizzard in a deal worth around 69 billion dollars or 56 million pounds uh it, it's been on and off for phrases it's been a million and one news stories over the past couple of years but a formal announcement uh, has been issued after the uk's own competition and markets authority approved the takeover essentially giving microsoft the green light to add the likes of call of duty world of warcraft candy crush and more to its xbox and pc portfolios quite what it's going to mean in terms of xbox exclusivity exclusivity remains to be seen uh, although as part of the deal, Microsoft has already agreed to keep Call of Duty on the PlayStation for at least the next 10 years, uh, while another part of the deal sees Ubisoft given streaming rights for those Activision Blizzard titles for another 15 years. So while it's a big deal for the games industry as a whole, it might not prove to be such a big deal for your everyday gamer, at least in the short term. I think Candy Crush would be a Windows Phone exclusive. <laughs> it would be brilliant. It is huge. Well, people when you talk about the deal it's like oh it's call of duty is the big thing candy rush is like it's already raked in like 20 million dollars it's just it's an insane cash cow so you can see why mm -hmm. microsoft might be keen to buy it and maybe do more things with it in the future. because you know got to get back there 69 billion dollars somehow well not for um, me they're not but it's good yes you know there's a it, it, this has been a will they win as you say for so long it is nice they finally actually it, it's it's fallen either way and it doesn't it's not in limbo at least every organization can now move forward with a degree of finality and certainty yeah yeah i'm quite looking forward just to seeing the end to all the will they won't they the latest <laughs> legal saga all this those stories have just been utterly tedious over the past year or so so yeah hopefully it's finally i mean i'm sure there's still a few steppings a few hurdles and you'll hear a few more bits and pieces about some of the hoops that microsoft will no doubt have been through to finalize it but uh but yeah it's They've announced that they put out a video and everything. So as far as I'm concerned, game over and dusted. Um, and just finally, to wrap up a little bit of hardware, uh, Japanese brand slash company Final has announced a new uh, gaming-friendly headset the launch of the new VR2000 DFO. Uh, they come with a $59.99 price tag, uh, similar setup to the VR3000, which came out uh, a year or so back. Uh, come with the promise to improve 3D spatial sound performance. Um, I personally don't use a gaming headset when I'm playing. I'm just full sound, full volume kind of guy. And Final's not a company that I'm particularly familiar with. But it's a relatively cheap option in the headset marketplace. I mean, I mentioned the Sony Zone Buds at £180 earlier on. So it could be like a, a nice sort of cheap and affordable alternative for gamers looking for a decent in-ear headset. Very shortly, Final is a very strange company. They're the only people I know that can make knock things like this out, and then they also make headphones that look like 50s science fiction prop that cost thousands and thousands of pounds. So, yeah, they are all over the place, but they generally speaking, they've always turned out some decent earbuds. So, I'm sure that they'll be perfectly reasonable. Good stuff, right? Um, I think that's the news covered that we needed to cover. Um, so, yeah, we just need to go to Martin now. Martin, you've had a very interesting product to look at, so why don't you tell us about that? 
Yeah, well, uh, back in July of this year, Yamaha announced that they had their new slate of soundbars arriving, uh, this time known as the True X um, system. Certainly, those are the ones at the top of the hierarchy. There are some lower down, but the key here being that they are doing, I guess you might call discrete immersive audio for the first time. Um, certainly for this bar, the allocation of uh, speakers is 4.1.2. Uh, that's the arrangement. Um, the version we tested uh, here comes to £999, this package, which includes the X40A bar, which is 101 centimetres in length, and um, also with the X100A powered subwoofer and a pair of the rather dinky little X1A surrounds. Uh, these are completely wireless surround speakers. So you can mix and match all of these products for the optimum system. You can either buy them with package pricing. Uh, Yamaha itsel itself even says that the biggest bang for your buck is if you purchase the X50A combined with the X100A subwoofer for £799. But like I said, you can buy them either with uh, package pricing or not. The build quality is pretty nice and premium. I like the way the cotton gauze wraps around the unit and actually digs into the passive radiators at the uh, ports at either end. So it's quite a neat, neat looking system. The sub has a slightly retro appeal, I suppose, with its textured grill and the tuning forks logo in the top left-hand corner, which is a little bit of a departure from the way that the uh, soundbar itself looks, which looks very much sort of very contemporary. And yet the sub has this slightly retro look about it. Um, the, the very fact, though, that you've got a grill allows for some more placement flexibility, <clears throat> seeing as it's not just a dull gray or black box. So if you have the grill facing you, it does look a little bit more pleasant than, uh, than maybe what some of the competition would offer. And again, those X1A surrounds, they're actually quite beautiful little things. Um, they're a bit like a little Amazon Echo or Fire TV Cube. They've got sort of very nice tactile top and the... Um, uh, the gauze material actually goes around without surround goes around the entire speaker without a break. Um, and the key here is that it can be used as portable streaming uh, speakers as well. So that's quite a nice touch. So you can either dial them in as uh, portable, I'm uh, sorry, as, as surround speakers to your left and right and have them literally sitting on a side table or even on the arms of the sofa. And then when your movie is over, you could, uh, you know, um, uh, store them for another time. But also you can stick them in a rucksack and take them away and use them as a wireless speaker on the go. So that's quite a cool thing. Um, the setup of the system is really very easy. Um, and the soundbar controller app, Yamaha soundbar controller app is full featured and very usable. I still find it a little bit annoying that manufacturers haven't found a good way yet to get playback info to the seating position by looking directly at a typical soundbar. Of course, you can use the app, but it would be nice to be able to look directly at the bar and get some kind of effective display that isn't just a few dots or a few little LED lights doing different things, which you have to then decode. Uh, but anyway, this all represents a bit of an overhaul for Yamaha's soundbar line because they're including, like I said, discrete Dolby Atmos rather than a post-processed form of DTSX or Dolby Atmos sound. This gives you a 4.1.2 sound field, as I said, split up into left, right, and two surrounds for the four, uh, the subwoofer as the 0.1 effectively, and two angled upward facing drivers for the 0.2. Uh, there was quite a bit of activity on the forums with members going back and forwards, some lamenting the lack of DTSX, while other, others think there's less relevance to include it, given it's the least adopted of the two formats, but this does come up occasionally. So Dolby Atmos is what we're stuck with here if you want to listen to immersive audio. The movie sound is actually pretty impressive. The surround envelope um, uh, has some height effect, and the two X1A surround speakers are excellent. And um, actually, even when I, I mentioned this in the review, but I was watching uh, The Exorcist, you get some really quite impressive uh, surround effects. 
But the nice, the the thing that I was really impressed with is that sonically, there's quite a smooth character to the sound field, and this is something you don't usually hear with the sound bar of this class, or um, for, uh, certainly within this price price range. And so, quite smooth, and um, not only that, but uh, quite a weighted sound stage as well on movies. So I was quite impressed with it. Um, but of course, uh, often with sound bars, um, my big beef is that for the most part, they're not a worthy replacement to a good pair of powered speakers or an integrated amp package plus speakers. Um, I found there's a thinness to the two channel music playback, which I wasn't completely happy with, but it's not atypical. And uh, when these companies are using racetrack drivers and other, I guess, compromises to fit into a rail in effect uh, with mounted speakers, it's not the uh, the best option. But that's uh, that's something that we have to deal with with sound bars. We have to live with it. Okay. Well, Martin's full review is on the site. If you want to uh, delve deep into that, then head over uh, to TV Forums and read his review. Thanks very much for that, Martin. Uh, right. So um, we'll be back in a sec with Ed and Hi-Fi. If you enjoy the podcast on YouTube, then please like and subscribe. If you're listening to the audio version, then please leave us a rating on your podcast app. We invite you to email questions and feedback to podcast at avforums.com and join in with this episode's discussion thread in the podcasts forum at avforums. Right then. Okay. Uh, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Phil. Um, not a huge amount doing in the world of hi-fi i'll come on to um uh what i'm going to talk about in terms of reviews it's an upcoming rather than a, a natural on the site review but first we do have some bits of news and uh, returning hastily to my um to my running order uh, we've got some new psb speakers ian at least i hope we do ian you're on mute Sorry, I clicked. I did a thing where I clicked on mute to go off and cough, and then just forget to. Unmute yeah, myself. I do that all the time. Don't worry. Uh, apologies, Aura. Okay, yes, PSP. Uh, good that you mentioned them. Uh, they have uh, released some new updated speakers to their Imagine series, uh, principally the new T54 and T65 Tower three-way speakers, which set to start shipping from the seventh of November, priced at one thousand one hundred ninety-nine pounds and one thousand six hundred ninety-nine pounds per pair, respectively. Uh, and they will be joined by the new two-way B50 bookshelves at £599 per pair. Uh, all of these models see some trickle-down technology from the company's flagship Synchrony series. Uh, includes the likes of an enhanced crossover design and driver setup. Uh, plus, there are also some design pointers from its alpha range uh, to deliver what the company describes as its true-to-nature sound philosophy. Uh, so, you know, could they be worth a listen? Almost certainly. Um, the affordable PSBs have always been actually very, very, very capable loudspeakers. We've dipped in and out of it over the years. The one thing I will say that's a massive step forward, this is comfortably some of the most aesthetically pleasing PSP speakers at this price point I've seen in a while. So, um, uh, yes, we'll see if we can uh, have a look at uh, some of them in stereo and who knows, a bit of multi-channel as well. We'll see what we can do there. Um, and uh, the uh, Good Burgers of, hang on a second, let me get the right town. The Good, yes, the Good Burgers of Newcastle have also got themselves some new retail options, don't they? Um, yes, courtesy yeah. of Focal and Name. Uh, the, the two partner companies or sister companies uh, got a new home, uh, courtesy of Pete Tyson, uh, the, the northeast in the, their Newcastle store. Um, to they've got a demonstration room to showcase and presumably sell uh, a good number of their products. Uh, it comes to fifty fourth, fifty uh, first, sorry, focal powered by name outlet in the world. Uh, joins the likes of Norwich, Carlisle, and Seven Oaks uh, as their locations here in the UK. Um, so yeah, if you want to have a, if you happen to be in the Newcastle area any time and listen to some focal or name uh, audio products, then you might want to pay Peter Tyson a visit. Did you say you've yeah. been, Phil? I've been, yeah. Um, we did uh, an evening up there with Bowers and Wilkins recently. I did a video. It's on uh, our YouTube channel if you want to go and have a look at it for the uh, the 800 series signatures. Um, but yeah, they had the uh, the focal name section. So it, it's a very impressive store in Newcastle. Mm. Um, I'm gonna, actually going to go and have a look at the Carlisle store on Wednesday but for the first time. But yeah, Newcastle, um, it looks like a, a normal shop unit when you walk in. You think this is not very grand. 
And I was going for an evening with lots of guests. I'm thinking, how are we all going to squeeze in here? <laughs> but there's a, a staircase at the back of the shop. You go up into the staircase and you, you basically have the top section. It goes across, I think, three units downstairs. So it's a massive area. Um, two, if I remember off the top of my head, I'll probably get this wrong, but there's two enclosed uh, demo rooms upstairs, um, acoustically uh, treated rooms. No, sorry, there's three. Is there? Yeah, I think there's three. I've probably got this wrong. Um, and then there's an open space to the left where you've got the focal and name stuff. Um, and there's also a Lynn uh, section. And um, yeah, there's, there's quite a few very high-end brands, including Bowers and Wilkins 800 uh, series speakers on demonstration permanently. So yeah, some very nice stuff in that store. Well, um, it's it's definitely, I think, the way it, it, there's a lot to be said. I mean, obviously, in, in, a, in an ideal world, you'd have both brands you know, in a way that they can be tested and, and, and experienced in a, in a more traditional sort of fashion, you know, pairing them with whatever you like. But those two companies have made an enormous amount of effort to become a cohesive whole. And I think you are going to start seeing a bit more of this mm. um, because there's, you know, there's there's money in survival at stake. So it does rather it does rather point in that direction. Can I just also, Ian, congratulate you on that stand first? That was extremely good. So I liked that. Thank you. Um, and then last, but by no means least, um, Astle and Kern have given us a new player. Uh, yes, indeed, they have. Uh, the Can Ultra um, has uh, been announced. Um, it's a digital audio player. Uh, perhaps the, the headline feature is an upgrade from the old quad-core processors to an octa-core setup, which just by name alone suggests a whole bunch more. Um, there's also the likes of digital audio remaster technology in there, and there's also a new ESS DAC as well uh, the whole package will set you back 1599 pounds um, it is also worth the note as well that the can ultra was announced alongside a new uh, ak hp1 dac uh, amplifier yes. uh, which comes in at 259 pounds uh, it features bluetooth and a host of connections to suit most of your input needs support for all of the usual sort of uh, suspects in terms of files uh, uh, including mqa um, so yeah, it'll be a couple of good things uh, from Aston and Kern on the way. Uh, well, out now, I think. Yes, we'll be looking at the uh, smaller of those products. Um, there's uh, the big players like the Can Ultra, and then obviously they they go further up than that. There's a bit of confusion over what these things are intended to be. Um, you can easily say, oh, you can do such and such by using insert smartphone of your choice and bolting a DAC onto it, and you absolutely can. Um, no pun intended. Uh, the the purpose of these is essentially they are very much dual use. Um, I have seen end users where effectively this acts as the front end for a very talented front end for their home systems. And then it travels with them when they, they spend a substantial amount of time away from it. Um, it's a big, chunky, satisfying thing to use. And, you know, a number of people we all place different uh, ascribe different values to aesthetics and function um and if it means nothing to you then all of these products are going to seem a little bit weird but that having spent a bit of time with the big players i mean there can be rune endpoints and things like that so at home it's a completely self-contained it works exactly the same as you know a conventional size streamer it just then can travel out with you and do all sorts of things there as well so it, there is a purpose to them um it's niche and as i say i'm not necessarily rushing to get this in for review but on occasions, I do see comments about these things, and it doesn't necessarily gel with actually what Aslan Kern is trying to do with this. So um, wish them the best of luck with it. I'm sure it's going to be very good, but we will be looking at the uh, smaller product first as a matter of priority. Um, right. Thank you, Ian. Um, I wanted to talk very, very briefly, and it will be very, very briefly because there's nothing to show in the, in the uh, bar for people watching live because nothing has been uploaded yet. I've got a set of the uh, all new Riga Aya floor stander. Um, a review for that will be going live next month. I'm writing the review tomorrow. Uh, I, I'm writing an October review in October. I'd like the record to state that. Um, this is uh, a very, very, very interesting product. I don't want to give too much away at this point, but Riga has been very, very bold here, um, essentially turning around to lots of other companies that are very wedded to MDF and flavors of MDF and actually going, well, you know, it's great, but if you want to keep building in the UK, you want things to cost certain prices, it can't be done that way. Now, they've 
sort of dabbled in non-NDF speakers with the kite, which was part of the System 1, but the IA isn't the same as the kite. It's made out of different materials, and the press, the press, sort of press material does rather suggest that this isn't a one-off. There's going to be more of these things. And it's an extremely brave thing. It looks different. It feels different. It behaves different to other speakers at this sort of 1600 1500 1600 pound price point um i will say i think on balance the gamble has paid off this speaker can do some deeply impressive things there's one specific attribute um uh which i'm not going to spoil at this point but there is one specific attribute they do where uh i've heaped praise on another brand for doing it this arguably might be even better um and i was genuinely taken aback by that i wasn't expecting it to be able to do this at the same time, um, most of the Riga reviews that we've done at almost any price point in the last four years have basically pointed out it's a tremendous piece of equipment and just as importantly, it's tremendously user friendly. It will drop into almost any circumstance and do what it does. Now, loudspeakers have got are up against it whatever happens they they cannot nest they cannot really meet these same criteria whatever happens the ayah is not going to delight is not an automatic delight for everybody um speakers are just more subjective than that um this is not me saying if you hook it up and measure it it does weird things it's not as simple as that it just has it has prioritized certain design decisions and certain aspects of its performance over other aspects of its performance this is much more uh, there are Riga products where i can say yeah you could buy that pretty much without reservation and it's going to delight you this is a little bit different but that is in part because it's a loudspeaker that is in part because it's a very different loudspeaker um nevertheless i just want to congratulate riga for not just going oh we can't do this at a certain price anymore and then just quietly dropping bits and bobs this is something that a number of manufacturers are going to have to grasp and come to terms with moving away from doing things in the old-fashioned way because the old-fashioned way now costs more than you can produce products at certain prices for so i think this is an important product i think it's a tremendously brave product and i think it is a sign of thing to, things to come and no less personally there are points where it is an extremely good product indeed the review for that will be going up in november um, it will be joined by um, amplifier reviews from uh, moon and musical fidelity uh, there are two i5 products, one very small, one not quite so small. Um, there's hopefully going to be some Sonus Faber duettos in the not too distant future, but there was a bit of a hiccup with the review sample. So uh, we need to see where that goes from there. Um, and um, I've also, you'll be pleased to know, people who follow the site long term, I've got the uh, Christmas long form review lined up and that will be showing up in November for me to write up. So you have something to read whilst uh, trying to avoid your family on Christmas Day. So that is what we're up to there. Um, all that is left for me to do is to do album slash vinyl and uh, playlist of the podcast. Um, album slash vinyl and album of the podcast are one and the same this time round. Um, I'm going to stick my hand up and say this is as much that I simply haven't had as much time to sit there on a Friday plowing through absolutely every new release album. So it's possible that I've missed a humdinger. But if I have... It's still going to have to go some to beat this. Um, this is an artist called Emily Wolf. Um, she has actually had a previous album of the podcast with a, her previous album, Outlier. This one is called uh, The Blowback, and uh, it's on all the major streaming services, and it's absolutely brilliant. Um, this lady writes some damn good hooks. Is actually, this is more out-and-out -out rock and less electronic tinged than the previous album, but it's not necessarily any worse for that. She still makes use of it from time to time to emphasise certain points. Um, it's a genuinely, genuinely excellent listen. Um, I say all the made streaming services, and uh, I would also say that the vinyl is uh, competitively priced, and it's from a label who generally turns out pretty damn good ones. So that's why it is both of those things. Finally, uh, playlist this month is Cobuzz, um, and it's supergroups when it, artists from more than one uh, act are, are bu bunched together to, to do things. Um, I've really enjoyed this because it's a reminder that for every time it goes absolutely right, sometimes it really doesn't go right at all. Um, as I say, it's on Cobuzz. If you want the link to it to port to another streaming service, we can do that. No one ever seems to ask, so um, I'm 
you know, I'm assuming that you will find ways of doing it if you want it done. But those are um, the recommendations. Um, if you think that I've missed the, something, do flag it up in the in the comments because I like listening to new music and I enjoy new music. So if you think that I'm unfairly shunning something, do let me know and I will correct that uh, as soon as I can sit down and get listened to something. So that is a relatively truncated hi-fi section um, and that is me done. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Ed. Uh, lots to uh, get through there. And um, before we wrap up, uh, if everybody's eyes can move towards the live chat, we'll just uh, quickly see if there's anything that needs to be cleaned up there. And um, uh, Halle, 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 sorry, said, uh, hi, AV Forms team. When can we expect a video review of the Panasonic MZ1500? I am working uh, on the MZ. I'm probably filming that tomorrow, actually, um, looking at my diary. So, yeah, that should be within the next week to uh, to maybe the week after. Um, got a few things going through at the same time. Yes, that is being worked on, as is the 950 and the Philips 908. And the Sony behind me here, um, uh, the video review will be going out tomorrow, maybe. If I can get the edit finished in time. I did the piece to camera today, so... Um, hopefully I'll get that finished in time to go out tomorrow. So that's all lined up there. Um, Elliot Cole says, for me, it's actually more of an issue when something emits a lesser format like DTS because it's going to fall down at the one time you really need it. It's probably fine here in relation to um, Martin's Yamaha review, uh, but the bar looks nice. Um, you, what you will find this year is that a lot of manufacturers are actually adding DTS back in where they've previously dropped it. Um, because there has been obviously uh, consumer feedback that has said uh, that people want DTS. So a lot of the TVs um, over the years that have dropped it, um, miraculously, it's all starting to reappear again uh, in certain products. So, so yes, um, Yamaha might have done that on this occasion. Um, I'd be surprised to make that that, uh, that mistake again, shall we say? Um, I, th I think there's quite a bit of feedback at the minute regards audio format support and. Um, a lot of box ticking going on where people, if they see a product doesn't have something, they're less likely to buy the product. So for box ticking matters. We can yeah. we can argue about it, but it does. And, it and does people are, are keen on features, having the benefit, knowing that a feature that they will almost certainly never use is there. Witness mm -hmm. the success of the uh, early pioneer Universal DVD players because people yeah. playing all those DVDAs and SACDs they didn't have and didn't want to yeah. listen to. Yeah, Ab absolutely. But yeah, it does it does do that. Um, just looking through again, uh, just to see if I can pull out any other questions. I'm maybe missing some of them here, but um, it looks like we've answered absolutely everything here. So, yep, thank you very much for your questions tonight. There is a bit of conversation going on there. Uh, if you're watching the podcast back on YouTube, you can obviously follow the conversation. Um, right. Uh, if you have got feedback tonight, if you want to talk about anything that we've discussed this evening, or if you want to talk about the podcast, because we are coming up towards the end of the year. And as you know, we tend to look at the podcast and make a few tweaks and changes and so on. And we're looking at doing that um, going into the new year. Uh, we're looking at um, maybe changing the format slightly and uh, maybe dropping some aspects and adding new. So if you have any ideas, if there's a particular section of the podcast that you enjoy, you want to see uh, us develop it a little bit more. If there's things that we don't do that you want us to see add into the podcast, um, is there subject areas that you would like us to look at that perhaps we uh, don't look at at the moment? Or do you want us to go into a little bit more detail on some of the things that we do cover? Are, are we too short with the TVs? Or are we too much TV and too little home cinema? Let us know. Um, give us your thoughts. What do you want us to see from the AV Forms podcast going forward? What kind of things do you want us talking about? Um, do you like us having guests? Do you want us to get more of the industry uh, to pop in and put the questions to them? Um, that kind of thing you know there, there's only set so many we can do in a year but if you give us some ideas as to what you actually want to see what you, what works for you what doesn't work for you um and like i say end of the year we're going to um just have a little bit of a a revamp and a, a rethink of what we're doing with the uh, podcast so if you've got any input on that let us know um but i think that's about it for tonight the next movies podcast is next week um so that is the 6th of november uh, so join the guys from half past eight on youtube if you want to watch that wait a second it isn't the six that isn't next week though is it we've got we've got um, we've got a, we've got a fifth monday again we? the the producer needs to be spoken to if this is wrong <laughs> very quickly 
uh, just bring up the uh, the forum because I, I know I do have the correct um, schedule in there. So just give me a sec. Um, yeah, I should have checked this earlier before we came on, really. Uh, right. So, well, we've uh, broken the forum, so you can. <laughs> we did, did the forums. Yeah. Right. So here we go. Uh, so the next movies podcast is. Uh, f- <coughs> 6th of November, but there's no podcast next week. This is where the confusion lies. Yes. Uh, so next week, it's the 30th of October. There's no podcast. Um, so the next movies podcast is the 6th of November. And the next podcast that you're watching right now, the main podcast is on the 13th of November. So those are the podcasts coming up soon. Um, yeah, the confusion lies because that's uh, an extra Monday. There's yeah. An extra Monday this month. Bonus Ooh. Monday. There you go. You got a bonus Monday. I'm going to submit an idea for the podcast that on these random Mondays we just uh, do a pre-recorded video of Ian jet washing things on Jet Wash Simulator. <laughs> a oh, truly man, relaxing, a out. truly <laughs> relaxing 45 minutes of him cleaning things. It will if be you want to see that, then let us know in the the podcast section of AV Forums. Find this podcast. It's the one that's marked with the, the today's date, which is the 23rd of October. And add your comments onto that. But that's it for this week. My thanks to Ian Martin. Are we not Ed. doing what are you watching anymore, Phil? I'm not watching anything. Are you? Um, it's Ma- it's MasterChef The Professionals. All else is noise. That starts at <laughs> no, nine. And if you yeah. delay me from MasterChef The Professionals, I should be cross. And, and Tuesday night's cake night because Bake Off's on. So I love this time of the year because I get to have <laughs> cake on a Tuesday <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks very much, guys, for your time. Um, and again, like I say, we're back. Uh, movies podcast, not next Monday, but following Monday, sixth of November. Right. Uh, if you've enjoyed the podcast, you can do all the cliched social media stuff. Go like it, subscribe to it, whatever. Um, do all that. I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much uh, for watching and listening. And we'll see you again next time. Good night. <laughs>